All right, Ingram Smith, Bud Elliott, back again for another episode of the Nolcast, uh, recording live for our friends on YouTube. So if you're listening to the podcast version of this, we might have a reference or two to uh, chat or YouTube or whatever else. But the uh, interesting show that we've got for you tonight, uh, Bud took a deep dive into a spreadsheet, and we've got some uh, really cool stuff to talk about as far as uh availability at positions kind of what the scholarship matrix looks like as far as what's here next year two years from now etc can kind of uh look at that as a reflection point as to uh what you're doing with your 24 class so starting to you know have some of these more significant benchmarks uh that just give you better detail as to who you're in on and uh where you might be getting some early traction so a little bit of recruiting, a uh, little bit of um, an idea as to uh, what your schedule is going to look like. We'll have a show next week for that that uh, we want to talk to you about as well. But uh, just a, a fun show and appreciate all the people in chat that have jumped in and have joined us. So, Bud, tip of the hat to Tarpon Sellers, uh, tip of the hat to Louisiana Hot Sauce. And uh, let's jump head first into a null cast. Let's do that. Are, are you the Seminole Godfather now? Well, let's see, see you in that <laughs> chat. That is that is impressive, man. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Make, well, make them an offer they can't refuse. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, okay. So first thing is we need to talk a little bit of new business, I think. Uh, the schedule comes out Monday. We will do a live show for this, and we're going to start it with uh, the defensive recruiting needs. Tonight, we'll hit offensive. And then whenever they officially drop the schedule, because the ACC is making a TV show out of it, then we'll jump in and discuss the schedule. I, I always kind of have fun. Uh, breaking that thing down and seeing when the bye weeks fall and when they don't. I, I thought FSU was treated really well by the league this past year. And uh, if I'm the boys in Charlotte, I'm trying to treat these dudes really well every single year too, because some of these teams are just not, uh, whew, um, man, just not not bringing any any talent. And FSU is bringing in some talent. Uh, they are bringing in more to the transfer portal than high school right now. And we'll see how that changes throughout the end of this year and throughout this show. Um, did you see the top 247 came out tonight? The final yeah. top 247 for 24-7 sports, which proud to work there. And they have been by far the most accurate recruiting service for the last half decade. And they invest a whole lot of money in it. So FSU did fairly well, man. Very interesting. Um, so of the kind of top 200 kids, 201 uh, we will conveniently use that benchmark for us uh, as you get Samson at 201, Blake Nicholson at 158, Conrad Hussey as the 111th prospect in the country, Lucas Simmons at 61. Um, with all due respect to your rankings, that might be the only one that I could uh, potentially see somebody that should be rated a little bit higher. And then Hakeem Williams as the number 24 prospect in the country, which uh, Hakeem we've talked about is – you know, upside is, is as high as, as you could possibly want on a wide receiver. And uh, that could be, you know, look, he's a five-star prospect. So I'm not saying that he's not appropriately ranked, but uh, that's one that you could look back in a couple of years and uh, think that, that he even outperformed that number potentially. So yeah, uh, yeah. I, I know nice Ivan's, little to the class. Ivan's on the 24 uh, seven sports recruiting YouTube tonight said he was uh, by far the most boomer bust uh five-star prospect out there if, if you've seen some of the tour of video you know tour of duty videos it looks like he's already really you're really getting pushed which is which is what you want i mean you're, you're going to want to get him on the field early and often as a freshman to get him some reps especially in some of these blowout games and maybe he can make a difference for you in games that are not a blowout uh, but i i think that makes a lot of sense right like hakeem did not have a lot of production in high school when he the, the things he did produce were really impressive physical ability flash moments you're like whoa both in football and in basketball, but it wasn't like he caught 100 balls this year. I mean, he might have caught 100 balls total in his high school career, right? So part of that was they didn't really have much of a quarterback, and he wasn't one of these guys that transferred, uh, you know, like to an Aquinas or, or, or something like that. But, yeah, I, I think that's a fairly good showing considering – you just think, think back like last year how bad your junior days were, man, to the point where you didn't need to have multiple junior days last year because – yeah, you just you're not going to drive home the point of, of the lack of talent that was interested in you coming off back to back losing seasons. And it's nice. It's 
it stands out to me some of the work that you were able to do in the final days and get Conrad Hussey. Uh, that that's a massive uh, pickup. Certainly gives you another uh, super high quality prospect. Just uh, looking at a kid just on the edge of the top one hundred, and um, yeah, that that's an interesting one. I mean, I'm not. I don't say this. I'm not knocking anybody that's currently on the staff, but that's one of the more wilder recruitments that I've ever seen historically. Because I don't know that you really had like a positional coach point of contact during that recruiting um yeah and i'm not i'm not trying to take shots at somebody but that that is a that was a wild one and the fact you're able to win that is significant and a, and a really nice piece uh but yeah those five guys obviously are kind of the cream of the high school class and uh it'll be a good reflection point you know in, in 362 days or something like that but if we're doing this are we looking at florida state signing a class that maybe has eight kids in the top uh 200 or 200 and 12 or whatever convenient number that we we pick to uh get that extra person tagged in i think so i mean it's it's a, it certainly is trending in that direction overall and um it's a it's a great litmus test for what the class can do uh, and what the staff can do with high school recruiting and, and how much priority they're going to put in it uh because from afar it would certainly appear as though they've got almost every advantageous situation that uh that they could want to have that kind of breakthrough high school class on the horizon. Absolutely, man. Uh, so speaking of your work, I, I saw my neighbor the other day. He was throwing football around, and he announced he was also getting a battles in deal. So it, it seems like you guys are locking down everybody who has the possibility to ever touch a football within about a 250-mile radius of Tallahassee. But uh, We'll grab you quick if you're a quarterback. Absolutely, yes. In, uh, in, in all seriousness, I did see the uh, the football focus collective hashtag, and I know a lot of people in the chat are, are asking, like, does that mean that that uh, at Battle's End is the, the football collective? Are, are you guys only football? We're or? not only football because that is limiting uh, in the NCAA's eye as far as how much the uh, institution can officially embrace you. For example, we have our – our deal with Learfield, where we were able to sponsor uh, the signing day coverage, and and um, we had a lot of bowl game stuff, and we'll continue to have. Uh, that's a that's a significant contract for numerous reasons. I also think it's about uh, twenty two months long or twenty months long, so it's not a it's not a short commitment. We'll continue to develop that, um, and one of the reasons we can do that is because we also have signed golfers, and and we'll sign. I don't think we're going to stop with football and golf, but that's what our uh, you know, first steps into this area are, and we are, um, we are the, the football collective. Yeah, we are. Uh, we will be, that will be our main focus. And, you know, if you want to do something that is a hundred percent football specific, uh, we'll have some public availability or public, um, opportunity opportunity thank you sir uh the the brain cells are tired and winded and uh and don't necessarily fire like they used to uh but yeah we'll have uh we'll have opportunities here hopefully somewhere around february 15th is our goal we're working with um some exceptional people on multiple fronts but we're having uh a guy who actually did nascar's fan engagement uh program uh work with us and is kind of building out our platform and website uh, right now. So we'll have something here soon and I'm really excited to continue to lay out uh, what our involvement is going to be in football. Nice, man. So hopefully the end game to getting all of these recruits is this, the NFL draft. And I wanted to share this because I was going through some of Mel Kuyper stuff last night. I couldn't sleep, dude. I, I don't think I went to bed last night until about three. And so I was just reading through some stuff and taking notes and, uh, uh, so check this out. This is Mel Kuyper's draft rating. So I'm going to go through this. And one thing I noticed that you may notice is that there are a lot of guys on here uh, who are on teams that FSU is playing, but they won't be on these teams because they are going to the draft. I'm going to run through a couple of these. So AR-15 from Florida, the number four quarterback. Uh, look, man, maybe there's some chance that, uh, that Florida looks back and, and doesn't, regret going six and seven with, with a first round quarterback, but I sort of doubt it. I don't think any of these other guys who project to go first round played quarterback on a losing team this year. So interesting. We'll, we'll see if they, if they, you know, kind of look back and see a missed opportunity there running back wise. I hope I have this, this print big enough. I, I will read these off. If you're on the podcast, we, we know most of our folks are still, and we still heavily lean podcast, and we like that because y'all have jobs, and that means that uh, you know you, you get to listen to this on your way to work or maybe on your lunch break. Uh, 
only one here is Israel is Avaconda of Pitt. So interesting. But on the just missed section, Sean Tucker. So he'd be like 11th, I guess. So not a ton of running back talent lost, but some interesting stuff here. Fullback, we're going to go ahead and scroll past. Dude, receiver. I, I, see, I do see a guy here who I think you're going to be happy not have to play, even though his team wasn't any good this year. Just no more Zay Flowers uh, is going to be, I think, encouraging. Right? No more Zay Flowers. Uh, no more uh, of the Brown kid at uh, UNC should you somehow come across them this year. And uh and Butte, so there you go. There's oh, three right. that uh, that you that you won't be seeing next year. So uh, not not going to break my heart for sure. Absolutely, no, no more downs here at UNC. Uh, you don't play Notre Dame this year. Let me see. Clemson loses Davis Allen, so I guess he's an NFL tight end. Will Mallory, I thought was actually a pretty quality player when healthy uh, from Miami, but never really stayed healthy for the Hurricanes. Uh, nobody here in the all. Also getting mentioned section, offensive tackles. Uh, man, if you're Ohio State and Oklahoma, you got to be kind of feeling uh, feeling kind of iffy with two guys on both both those lists. Syracuse, though, this is interesting. I don't think Syracuse is really in position to, to replace a uh, like a second or third round offensive tackle, and that uh, that has to hurt, man, for sure. No, I think the last podcast that we had, um, it's it's maybe 35 minutes into it or so, uh, but we talk a little bit about how NIL, in my opinion, is kind of uh, accelerating maybe some of these schools' ideas. It's also going to shape their conference expansion perspective because yeah. it, it is it's becoming particular clear for some of these schools that like my lord in this landscape, like we're not this just isn't it. This isn't us. This isn't gonna be us. Um, and the amount of, uh, <laughs> you know, the amount of depletion of talent, uh, from the ACC, particularly kind of the bottom half, as you talked about the Wake Forest, the Syracuse's, um, you know, Pitt, they're not a bottom half team, but still Boston college, Boston college. Mm, going to be really both Virginia schools, really interesting to see what happens and where the league itself kind of falls into line in this, uh, hierarchy of college football and, and maybe how it accelerates the decision-making process of some of these institutions. I, I, yeah, man. Like I really think if, you know, somebody asked me the other day about like Norvell's contract and I said, look, I, I think Florida state will take care of him. I also think that Mike Norvell is a really smart guy and has a smart agent and they understand the way this league is going. If you're doing your job right at all, you should roll out of bed and go at least eight and four every year because you're just going to have so many freebie wins where the rosters are just not comparable. They're just not. Mm -hmm. um, and that's happening. That is happening faster than I anticipated with this, to be honest. Like I did not think that you would see the quality of, of roster at like a Q's Virginia, Virginia tech, just totally tank as fast as, as I think it probably is. Um, all right. Offensive line here, Osiris Torrance from Florida. He was obviously a very good player for them. Uh, Jordan McFadden at Clemson. And then uh, from the center position, uh, nobody that FSU plays for the center position. Now let's go to defensive end, Miles, Mur Miles Murphy. Very happy not to see him anymore. You don't play – do you play Georgia Tech this year? I'm trying to think. Don't believe do. so. Wait, do uh, or, or next year, one of the two. Apologies. Yeah. All right, so Keon White's gone. I, I think Tech's in trouble, by the way. I know I talked to you after convention, but like the word I got was, and I said this on cover three today, so I won't, uh, I'm not really giving away state secrets here, but I, th I think the guys that they actually wanted realized that Georgia Tech was absolutely broke as far as like the size of their assistant pool, and mm -hmm. uh, they were they were not happy with it. I think that's why uh, you saw some guys pull out of that interview process. No Notre Dame there. Okay. Bowling Green, Clemson. KJ Henry from Clemson. I, I'm surprised he's that low. It's just one guy's list. Yaya Diaby, obviously from Louisville, but you don't play Louisville this year, which is interesting because they kind of look pretty good to me. I, I was doing some of my early ACC prep work, and if there's a team that can make the ACC title game that's not named Florida State, Clemson, or maybe North Carolina, I think Louisville might be the fourth just because of who they played. No Clemson, no FSU on their schedule. So it's not crazy to think they can they can find a way to go like seven and one, 
within the league. Uh, Pitt from Klaja Kansi. This is the one. I, this is the reason why I decided to put this on the show tonight, dude. Kuiper has him going tenth overall. Mm-hmm. Like that's a major loss to lose an interior defensive lineman of that quality. So Brian Brzee, you already know about him. Jervon Dexter from Florida, gone. Um, yeah, Trenton Simpson from Clemson, number two inside linebacker in this class, according to Kuiper. Who else do we have? No, uh, Peyton Wilson, NC State. You don't play NC State this year, but you do next year, I think, right? So uh, won't, won't won't miss playing him, but obviously he was a really good player for them. Auburn, Tennessee, Michigan, Georgia, Army, LSU. LSU, B.J. Ojolari, edge rusher there. I think that's why you saw LSU attack the portal the way that they did. Anything else? We, nobody else on that one. What do we see here at corner? Syracuse. Again, and then Miami with 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 Tyreek Stevenson. Um, Oregon State, Utah, and M. So nothing, nothing on the just miss safety wise. Florida State, Jamie Robinson, the fourth rated safety. Good for Jamie, man. That's if you're the fourth rated safety, you're probably like what top four rounds. If Kyrie's probably, right about this, uh, probably late third round pick. If that's the case, yeah. And I that that'd be great for Jamie. Yeah, that's. Uh, that's kind of where he internally valued himself. I don't think I'm letting anything away, uh, anything like that. I shouldn't say there. Uh, and that's what he thought he'd be. And good for you, Jamie Robinson. Hope you, hope you hit that 40 time and, and uh, do the underwear Olympics in the manner that you need to. And third round would be awesome. Awesome to see for that kid. Absolutely. Uh, NC state's kicker is finally gone. That kid is, is just absolutely nails. I, I thought he was going to play there forever. Uh, returners. NC State, Thayer Thomas is also gone again. You don't you don't play them this year. Long snappers, I don't really care. And Giannis is getting voted as an all star. So I'm going to stop the screen share <laughs> at this point. Um, but anyway, just wanted to kind of share that with you guys. FSU has one guys on these lists, and a decent number of your opponents have some dudes. And I don't think that most of your opponents are replacing them. I, I also want to point this out. So, and I don't take pleasure in anybody getting hurt right like i i got a bum shoulder right now like it's not fun to, to be hurt but i saw this news when i was i was going down to battle miami over the weekend so florida obviously lost richard goriage to the draft they lost uh you know their their huge guard to the draft number one guard in the whole in the whole thing um and they lost michael tarquin to usc one of their one of their starting tackles and then they lost Ethan White, who's a pretty good player for them. And I know some schools thought he was maybe the best guard available in the draft. I, I'm going to take Byers over him personally, but definitely a highly regarded guy. Again, to USC. And then you think back, they'd already lost Josh Braun, right? Who FSU was interested in, kind of kicked the tires. Would they have taken Josh Braun? I, I don't know. Maybe if, like, I, I think it's it's debatable. Certainly somebody that early on they had interest in. And you never know exactly who's going to jump in. You have, you may have a feel. So he went to Arkansas. And then, unfortunately, Cam Waits, who was a starter for them, blew his Achilles on Friday. Mm. So, I uh, I mean, Florida, to me, their best position last year, by far, was, was the offensive line. So now you're losing two starters to the draft, two starters to USC that USC is thrilled to get, you lost a kind of a key backup who at least can play in the SEC to Arkansas. And then Waits blows his Achilles. And, and I mean, that's very unlikely that you're going to be back at, at, and be able to play and be an impact guy this year. Certainly, we hope it gets, you know, gets healthy. Uh, but that's a huge, huge drop off. And they took some guys in the portal who are very, I'm not sold on. Like, I'm mm -hmm. not sold on the kid they took from Bama, and I'm not sold on, on the kid they took from Kentucky. Yeah. Now, I think those guys are really high upside. The Goodwin kid, and then um, I now I forget the Bama kid's name, but he was not particularly good when, when he played for the Tide. It seems like they those are more like 2023, or excuse me, 2024 year projections. I'm not sure that they help, they step in this year and, and help Florida. So Napier really need to be hitting up by Mike Norvell, like, hey, how, 
how do I recruit effectively after two straight losing seasons to start my career? This is that's not it's good, interesting. Man. It's interesting. I mean, we talked about the uh, the Rashada situation. Obviously, the the vast majority of the college football world has talked about over the past seven to ten days. Um, Florida State is a program; it's not a place to really throw stones. Being where they've been over the past four or five years, but it, Florida is in an interesting situation right now, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that sorts itself out who takes blame or places blame uh, for some of the situations that have transpired, what the ramifications of that are. Um, Florida is an interesting thing to kind of keep an eye peeled towards right now. Uh, it's a, it's a program that uh, has all the potential in the world and will probably find its footing in time, but uh, it's a little bit of a rough start, rough launch right now for Napier. Yeah, for, for sure. Um I, I seem for some reason I have more confidence in Mario at Miami than I do Napier at Florida hmm. overall, okay. which is that I, I'm not, I'm not sure how to explain it. I just, I, I just do. Cause I think he's going to have more support. And I think, I think Florida has less invested in Napier than, than Miami does in Cristobal. Like Cristobal has to work for Miami. Yeah. I you took, like. you literally took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, that this is, yeah, it's got to work. And if it doesn't work with the pieces and ingredients that they have down there, uh, it would Miami's going to have a hard time looking at itself in the mirror and I think seeing a, another opportunity like that for it to work. So uh, you're right. There is much more of a sense of urgency and perhaps a singular opportunity uh, that exists down in Coral Gables than, than in Gainesville. What uh? What do you want to go to now? Let's yeah, man. So I kind of referenced this a little bit in the uh, in the stumbling opener that I did, but I do want to talk about um, kind of about long term as to what it looks like as far as portal high school, how the staff may view it, uh, how they're going to internally handle with a uh, class of high school prospect that they've never had really show interest with them at least at least at this number uh they've certainly had some some nice pieces and you know there'll be some kids that want to climb on board i imagine uh that in other years they probably would have immediately taken and i'll be fascinated to see how they manage the uh the numbers here i will tell you real quickly that if uh they're managing the numbers well People at Resolution Home Loans, or the legendary team, excuse me, legendary home loans, uh, are doing nothing but exceptional management of your numbers, bud, mine, and uh, so many hundreds of listeners of ours that I'm having a hard time even keeping track. It's been a, a beautiful partnership, and there's uh, no greater person for you to uh, pair with than our friend Shannon Young, 844-FSU-LOAN, 844-FSU-LOAN. Grab Shannon, talk to him for 10 minutes, figure out whether or not you have uh, the opportunity that you might think you do in your mind uh, in the housing market and see where Shannon can be a great partner for you as well. So big thanks to those guys, as always, for everything that they do for the Noel cast. And um, yeah, let's talk about it, man. I, uh, I, mean, I, I do have a question for you. Sh- please. Did mortgage rates just drop like incredibly because literally during the show, I am getting texts. From my wife, uh, showing a home that is forty-five percent more expensive than the home I'm currently podcasting from. Mm. Which is that, or, I, or maybe Mags has, has hacked my CBS email and has found out that I got some enormous raise that I don't know about. She's um, uh, she's on it. She's, Shannon, uh, Chad, if you guys got any like extra special <laughs> deals for podcasters, third time's the charm, right? I've already used you guys twice. Eight four four FSU loan. House is nice. I don't think we actually need this, um, but hmm. all right. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Let, let's let's talk big picture. I, I was uh, I was chuckling about what I was getting texted about. <laughs> uh, big picture. How do we? And Chad says he's got you. So there you go. That's you that's go. the type Look of that. responsiveness that we talk about when we say. Uh, Chad is literally in the chat. Yes, Boom. exactly. Uh, we we partner with great people and would encourage you to as well. So, um, yeah, man, uh, you know, the portal in high school discussion is something that we've had for a couple of years. See how that kind of changes over time and where opportunity is, um, you know, with what I'm doing with the battles. And I may know a little bit more than I did six months ago about this. I certainly don't have like their high school blueprint or anything else uh, as far as, you know, what I think this staff is going to do, but just from some, 
you know, loose conversation, I'll tell you that I don't think they're going to go too hard away from the portal as to what they're doing. I mean, I, I think, you know, you may kind of incrementally knock up your high school um, prospects that you're signing as far as a number of perspective. You knock them up maybe two in this class and, and continue to move slowly. Uh, but I think the portal is going to be a significant part of this program for the foreseeable future and that this staff doesn't see it as a Band-Aid. Uh, it sees it as a tool and, and a tool that they're not going to put back in the toolbox anytime soon. I think that's really interesting. I mean, some questions I would have about that, right? Like, obviously, they've done a tremendous job evaluating the portal. Derek Ray has done a really good job with that. I think the coach has done a nice job recruiting out of the portal. Um, part of your portal this like decision-making has to be, how good do you feel like you need to be in 24, right? Because I, I, everybody over there, I can tell you right now, thinks they're going to be very good this year. They They do. They, they have confidence defense is going to be better. They think, they think the offense is going to be really special. That's from everybody I talk to. That's what they think. I'm assuming you're getting the same. Like they, I, I would say that our actions track with that uh, fairly yeah. significantly. Yes. So for 24, I mean, you're going to, and we'll go into this when we do the, the offense you know, position by position breakdown here. Do you feel like you can make a run in 24? Because the non-conference schedule is, Host UF, go to Notre Dame. It is the first year of the 12-team playoff. You get Clemson at home. You obviously lose Jordan. That'll be Klubnik in year three with Clemson. So they might be really good. They might not be. You know, we don't really know. Um, you get Virginia Tech and Georgia Tech, who I don't think are going to be any good anytime soon, personally. Like, Vatex recruiting is not good right now. They signed a class of, like, Zero four stars. Maybe one kid finally got a fourth star. I, I got to go check it. <laughs> North Carolina without Drake May. You know, you go to Miami. I mean, by that point, who knows? Maybe Miami's a mess. Maybe that talent's really clicking. I, I don't really know. That's, you know, two years from now. Boston College comes to Doak. NC State comes to Doak. And you got to go to Cuse, which I'm not really worried about Cuse anymore. They may have a new coach by then. Do you think you could make a run again in 24? Do you think the expanded playoff makes it so that you're trying to like make the playoff every single year now? Or do you think that you can treat 24 as like a bit of a consolidation of gains regrouping year to where you're, you're developing a lot of this young talent? I'm curious what you think about that. I think it's a great question, man. And it, it will be somewhat dictated by how what you start to see from some of these guys uh like sorry, so like there's the fentrell cypress type of guy that you go hey this is one of the better players in a position in the country that's available you're gonna bring him in put him in the metaphorical shop window he's going to the league next year right then there's like gone if you're projecting yeah then there's like the gilbert Edmonds and some of these other guys that are more like okay so you're bringing in high talent um upside He's using his transfer, so you have some degree of confidence that he'll be here for, you know, multiple years. You can build, and I think it's really dependent upon what you start to see from some of those guys and how ready they are to step in and have 23 be, you know, their year. Um, I think it's it is a very interesting discussion as as you kind of push your your chips into the table here on 23. You've got all these guys going back. You're gonna have by all accounts, a very nice year. And is 24 more just kind of something that you're approaching at is trying not to lose momentum, not, not, not to lose steam, not to have some kind of regression to go, oh, well, is this just a one-off where you got all these guys back in 23 and you happen to have Jordan Travis, blah, 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 or is the program really moving in that direction? And I think a lot of these guys that have been added um, in this transfer portal class are – you know, there's the buyers and the cypresses and stuff, but there, there's really guys that are going to Daryl Jackson's a fantastic example of it. Guys that are going to be pieces for you this year, but be feature pieces for you next year. And I, I think that's, Oh, Hey, I yep. do want to tell you this. I talked to a guy who attends mm. a lot of Miami's practices and he yep. said, Hey, I think you guys potential you know, starter Florida state. He goes, I think Daryl Jackson's going to league after this year. I think okay. he's that good. And, and he's like, I, I bet you he's a lot better than that fist kid y'all took. I'm like, yeah. well, I'm not on staff. 
but that is interesting, and I, I will certainly pass that on to my audience. Um, <laughs> I'm not on staff. If he's I'm better than Fisk, not in the business of making talent uh, evaluations. We're gonna tell some serious lies. If he's be- if he's like that much better than Fisk and is going to the NFL after after this year, I don't think it's outrageous to think that Jackson ends up being a starter after after maybe game four or five. I mean, he he will be fascinating to see how much he emerges on the scene. If you want to see a 24 guy that's not a portal. What is what do you start to see more consistently from Josh Farmer? I mean, that's a guy who's yep. who's going to be who's a massive part of your defense in twenty four. So, um, I think you know, I think to an extent, the roster will somewhat uh, answer that for you. And then, if you have a great year and you continue to have a coach who wears the portal crown, uh, then you know maybe you you go back to telling yourself the lies that you'll just do it again next year. You know, you'll go grab next year's. Fentrell Cypress and and next year's Fisk and Byers, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, 23 is a, a special year and we're all going to be in, anticipatory, <laughs> fantastically nervous uh, to see these next seven and a half months go by or whatever. And so that we actually get to see this team. Uh, but I think one of the greatest parts about 23 is you're going to going to get a pretty good idea as to, you know, what that underlayer roster looks like and, how good of a year, how how much of a, a slide you can prevent in 24. I mean, look, I, I'm sure the, these conversations are the same conversations that, that Norvell is having to have internally, right? Like how many kids do we offer at this position or that position? It, it has to be what he's asking in, in staff meetings because you got to cast a wide enough net in case you have a really, really good year and a bunch of guys go and it's clear that 24 is not a year where uh, – a run run is possible. It's more like, let's make sure that you don't go seven and five. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and the, thus you load up on, on high school kids more, or maybe it's like, look, you know, 23 was good. Not, a, not as many of these guys are going to the league as we thought. There are some guys like, look, you know, Johnny Wilson has two years left. If he wants Now I don't think that's He's going to be using those two years. Well, you want to just get in the positions here and, and just kind of go to, so we can talk like like the, about this. But I, at this point, I think from the high school thing, I am done taking good high school football players. Mm-hmm. If I'm Mike Morrell, I don't care about that. I only want tools and traits that can develop you into a stud level player. Okay, if you're just a good high school player, a lot of polish, very productive, but you don't have elite physical tools, I don't care. Because I'm having to invest a year or two in you to get you college ready, and your college ready ceiling is only up here, even if I'm very confident you're going to be at least a good college player. You know, I can get in the portal, good college players. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't get in the portal for the most part, based on what that slide we saw, elite college players, not as not a ton, like not like first round type kids. You can get a lot of good to really good players, you know, and I think that's it. Like, I'm going to be sort of judging the recruiting classes going forward on are you using a, a scholarship on this kid out of the high school ranks? Does he have elite physical traits? Like take Edwin Joseph from the last class, the the, the, the corner they signed. Look, Edwin Joseph is really freaking fast. Is he raw? Yeah. But if he hits, he, you will not get a kid out of the portal who has hit, who had – Edwin Joseph's high school speed coming out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You might get a guy who who busted at the previous spot or just never clicked and then have a chance to develop him. But like if Joseph hits, he's a you know, like a second round talent type guy. Mm-hmm. That's sort of the difference of, of it to, to me. And that, that's kind of the lens that that I'm I'm looking through when I evaluate high school recruiting now. You know, I, I want to see a lot of top hundred guys. I want to see a lot of guys in the top two, four, seven. It's um, I, I think that part in particular is kind of what I was trying to say earlier um, that like you're going to have kids that that are have a level of interest in you that you haven't seen. And I'll be really interested to see how when you start to take commitments, what they look like and how these numbers start to sort themselves out, because I don't uh, this isn't a criticism of the staff uh, at all. I'm not even sure, and and it's just one man's opinion, I'm not sure that they are fully aware as to how much of an uptick in interest they're going to receive uh, and and how different this recruiting cycle will be for them uh, 
based off off the past ones. And how could it not be? You're not going to have to tell people you're 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 not going to be fired. You know, you're not. You're. Right. It's just. It's. It is 180 degrees uh, in a different direction as far as where the winds are. Um, you're going to have winds in your back, and I'm fascinated to see how they kind of steer this ship uh, with a you know with a general landscape of of which they've never really had to uh, never really had to see. So that'll be fascinating. Very interesting. The, the last dynamic here, obviously, and, and uh, NIL cannot be an inducement for recruiting, obviously, per NCAA rules, and, uh, but it is becoming apparent to me that the marketability of transfer players, uh, in many cases, is higher than the market value, uh, for marketing purposes, of course, of players who are in high school. And if, uh, if the portal becomes significantly more expensive, uh, then that could also cause a market shift, not only in Tallahassee, but but everywhere that, that yeah. recruits the portal, which at this point is every school. Because even Georgia Tech, too, right? I I I have a hard time not seeing it going in that direction. I just think that people, um, collectives, whatever term you want to put on it, are just going to say, man, for this quality of player that you get in the portal, you pay – you know, one to two years, you find him marketing deals for one to two years. And, but you, you've got such a great idea as to what this is going to be. Where the high school kid, not only do you not know where it is, um, if you're using NIL uh, to, you know, recruit once you get in there, uh, of course, and sign a contract, well, now you're, you're paying that premium, but you're paying it for two years in all likelihood of minimal production. Sometimes you get more. Um, and then you're still not really sure what ultimately you have there. So I do think that the highest end of the portal pricing is going to get bonkers. Like it's not, it's not even, it's not there. Uh, it is like going the Drake to, made 5 million alleged offer. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these guys in 2020 who haven't used a transfer yet are, are the most, the most valuable commodity in college football right now is a kid on a roster who hasn't used his transfer. Uh, and I, it, will, it will be fascinating to see what that happens. But I do think that the markets are still in flux, and I think that there's going to be more of a premium as we move forward towards the portal and a whole lot less NIL involved in, in certain high school recruitments. Makes sense. All right, you want to do uh, position by position? Let, let's talk like, you know, just pr pretend that you're Derek Ray and, or, or Mike Norvell, or, or maybe just swap back and forth and, and be multiple personalities and, uh, you know, kind of conduct the staff meeting, if you will. And like, let's, let's play in for 24 and, and the future and see kind of like, do you think you need it? You need a transfer or maybe it's just a, maybe it's just a luxury. And then what do you want to do at the high school as far as numbers wise? I'm, I'm, I'm curious to, to, to play this game if, if you're willing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Start a quarterback. Why not? Um, we getting Jordan back. <laughs> uh, I've, I won't even make that comment. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Jordan Travis will, will move on, uh, in all likelihood and, uh, hopefully moves on as a Heisman trophy winner and many other accolades, uh, tied to his name. So immediately at quarterback, you're going to talk about AJ Duffy, uh, Tate Rotomaker to an extent. Um, and you brought in Brock Glenn this year, and you also have uh, a really touted prospect out of, out of Savannah in uh, Croman Hawk, who I know uh, people seem to be really excited about. So uh, got a lot of different options there, and it will be interesting to see. Uh, uh, one little small piece of inside information that I'll give to the audience is a couple weeks ago, a high school coach uh, reached out to me. Uh, he is a high school coach of like one of the top, like top, top high school quarterbacks in the country and expressed an interest in Florida State. And the feedback that I got from Florida State is that we think we've got one of the best quarterbacks in the country committed. We're really not interested in expanding uh, our high school pool on quarterbacks right now. So um, they like what they have. Absolutely. Not, no need to go to California for a quarterback when you got one in your own backyard who is really, really talented or, you know, anywhere else. Um, yeah, I, I like Kerman Hogan an awful lot. He is the example, I think, of, like, is he actually a really good high school quarterback right now? He He's okay. He has some really good games. He has some games where he struggles. Does he showcase elite tools? 
Yes. That's, and I think that's what you have to be looking at now because I'm not recruiting for floor, right? I'm recruiting for ceiling, period. Like, Kremlin Hoke has a really big arm. I continue to contend that's probably the real reason why Chris Parson decommitted mm. when they were both throwing at elite camp last year, which I do look forward to seeing elite camp actually be elite once again uh, this year, and I, I would expect that it will. Uh, he was a better thrower of the football, just velocity, the way the ball jumps off his hand, the, the, the way he spun it, accuracy as well. Um, he's a guy that I think would probably be recruited Maybe not at like the highest level to play safety, but he would. I think he's like a scholarship level athlete at other positions as well. So if he hits, you are not acquiring that in the portal, right? Like that, a guy with that level of arm and that level of athleticism who is a hit is not jumping in the portal. He's staying at whatever school he goes to because they have him locked down for the most part. So, I mean, you're not going to take two, two high school quarterbacks, I don't think, at this point. Uh, I, I'd be very surprised if you did. Do you think you'd take a portal QB? Potentially. Absolutely. I mean, a, a, again, it's going to be one of these things where Florida State has to adjust to the type of prospect that's interested in them. I mean, you know, there, there may be higher, more polished uh, prospects that that come to them uh, than than they're used to. Now, obviously, you got Jermaine, and that's a that's a different level athlete. And I mean, the fact that Jermaine, like, flies down and goes to basketball games and stuff as a one-year player at Florida State is incredible uh, just to see the impact that the program had on him and what kind of the, the long-term identification of a, a guy and the way that he's uh, attached himself to this program. Anyway, um, I do think that if you have a super high end quarterback reach out to you in the portal, which is very possible, particularly if you have the type of year that Jordan may well have, then yeah, I, I absolutely think you would entertain a quarterback here. I, I think I agree. Like the staff's just going to have to make a call on this based on what they see in practice and on, on the limited reps and games that these guys are going to get, you know, during some blowouts or hopefully only during blowouts because Jordan's going to stay healthy. Um, but like I don't know if there's an arm in the room right now that that you're all that worried about angering, right? Because you brought in somebody else, like that you think can beat them out if you do for especially if it's like a one year type thing, you know, because because Tate has three years left. He'll have two years left after uh after 23, I believe. So, you know, you think about this, like Unless Tate, Duffy, or Glenn just show so much in camp this year and in practices, I I could totally see them taking a portal guy, especially if it's like a one year dude, like like if, if Pratt had decided not to not to stay at Tulane this year, right? Like a one year band aid that you're confident the twenty four roster is not going to go you know, seven and five with, right? Minimum is going to get you to to X. I. I or who knows? Maybe it's uh, maybe it's something that you you think Tate really can do it. Maybe he can. I I, I can't really answer that right now. Mm -hmm. But I I don't think that you have to go into twenty four with just those dudes. Those dudes. Maybe you do. Yeah. So you're looking at moving uh, down the line to the running back room and current pieces that you have on the roster for twenty four. Rodney Hill, Sam Singleton. Uh, you have the super dynamic uh, prospect at uh, Albany, Georgia there and Cam Davis uh, committed and excited to see what ultimately comes that. And obviously uh, interested to see what uh, what that elite two sport athlete ends up looking like. But then, then you've got targets in this year's class. Of, and you got uh, Toa Philly, too, right? I mean, like. Toa Philly would be there in 24. Yeah. Yeah. Like that would be his last year. Yep. Except, pardon me. Pardon me for leaving. Leaving uh, Lawrence off that. But, um, yeah, Hill, Singleton, Toe Philly. You also got uh, C.J. Campbell, the walk-on, Keziah Holmes, whatever ends up in happening with him from a scholarship perspective. You got some interesting pieces there. We'll get a better idea as to what Holmes looks like later in the year. 
main high school target at this point, Jordan Lyle? Anybody else out there, Bud, in your opinion, uh, the STA kid, Jordan Lyle, uh, is who I'm talking about. Is there anybody else that immediately I, jumps out to you at this position from a high th- school standpoint? That's probably the the, the main one. Uh, I did see a kid from Philly, actually, who, who I, I, I liked uh, liked an awful lot. Um, I actually need to figure out what his name was. I, I have everything broken down. You'll see it on 24-7 Sports uh, with all the kids' jersey numbers and team names that I shot. It was like 500 clips from, uh, from Battle 7-on-7 seven seven over the course of two days. I think you're already seeing... A lot of that footage end up on 24 seven sports, just in, in the, like the videos that play at the top of all the articles. Um, but you know, he was good by the way, there's a tight end on his team, not an FSU guy. Uh, his name is Johan. I, I, I tweeted the clip though. Jo- Johan something. He's probably like five, 10 to 55. Okay. Like kind of built like an oil drum and dude, he caught I, I was trying to shoot a video of a very high profile kid on his team. And instead, like I'm shooting a video and he caught every damn ball in the two games that I shot. I'm like, damn it. Like, why do they keep throwing it to this kid? And I'm like, yeah, you know what? Eventually, I'm gonna start filming the kid they throw the ball to every time. And I talked to his coach, and he's actually at Emitep, which is where Nasir Upshur played ball, right? Up in Philly. And he's like, Yeah, the guy caught 11 passes for us in the state championship game. Like, he just Really great hands, understands how to get open. And he actually threw a pretty nice juke on a kid, too. So, like, somebody's going to get a unathletic-looking H-back. Mm-hmm. They're going to cut, like, 10 or 15 pounds of bad weight off the guy. And he, it, either in Maction or, like, you know, CUSA on Tuesday or Wednesday night, the, the guy's going to be a tremendous prize picks play. For right, him. I was, so that's like, exactly right. where I was going. Go yeah. over catches here. And, that like, kid, three here. balls out of the backfield, and boom, we're there. Um, prize picks going to set one and a half for the over-under. We're going to be like... Yeah, it was crazy, man. Like, that's... Like, wow. And they couldn't come. Nasir Upshur. That's... I was going to ask when who's who the last kid that... Florida State signed out of Philadelphia was. Um, it's got to be Nasir, right? Only because I wanted to force a Nick Moody reference into the podcast. But no, it is it is Nasir, I'm sure. So, uh, funny. <laughs> um, so, all right. I do think you want to take two backs. Uh, I, I was trying to think, like, who Cam Davis actually reminds me of. And because he catches the ball so well, he's kind of like a shorter, more compact Joe Mixon, I think. Okay. The, the, guy, the guy on the Bengals. You know, I just a, a player I thought was really good. Obviously, got the bad rap, well deserved because he, he he punched that chick in, in in the dining hall or whatever. But uh, like playing style wise, I see a lot of that in Cam Davis. So I'm 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 encouraged. I think he's a very high level prospect. Obviously, good body control guy, does have decent top end speed. Acceleration is very strong, and he's a, a thick, strong dude and somebody that like Florida State. That is the kind of player you need to be taking out of the transfer, or excuse me, out, out of the high school ranks. A guy mm-hmm. with real high level upside, you know, a, a difference maker for you there. So, um, yeah, I, I think you'll see some more names emerge. They'll probably want to get verified times. We have the Under Armour and the ESPN coming up here, as well as uh, Catapult, will be having their combine series coming up throughout the state. And I don't have any opening regional dates yet, but I'm sure we'll see some of those. Coming up, so we're we're about to get a whole lot of verified info coming out of stuff very soon. Um, I think that's one reason why you saw a lot of those Florida Fire guys get offers. By the way, because I know uh, I was actually at the convention talking to um, to Dennis, who runs Florida Fire, and I was talking bourbon with one of the catapult dudes. And Dennis came up, and we were just all chatting. I was like, "Why don't you?" I was like, "Dennis, when's your tryout?" And I don't go to Florida's tryout because about 10 years ago, they pulled this move and Dennis and I joke about this now uh, where they were like, Calvin Ridley's going to commit right oh, along yeah, with Devontae I, Phillips. Remember you told me, you remember this. Yeah. yeah. And they, and I was like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll make the drive. <laughs> Drove down. They committed to playing for fire mm-hmm. the team that they were on already, you know? I'm like, okay. But anyway, like now Dennis and I are cool and, and you know, he's, he's, good dude and whatnot. But uh, I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing so many guys from fire get offered because they were all wearing the catapult gear during their tryouts. So all the schools got the accurate mile an hour data. Yeah. Anyway, we're, we're rambling here. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, we have like three more positions to get through, but we're about to get a lot more data on these kids. 
that will change these recruiting boards an awful lot, especially because I really believe high school recruiting is going to be so traits focused going forward, not only in Tallahassee, but really at all these schools that that are data focused. So let's move to uh, tight end, but uh, can't let a data focused reference slide by without mentioning Matt Lewis and our friends at Congruity working on Matt uh, on another project right now, personally. And uh, I can't, can't reference uh, the experience that I've had with Congruity um, in any way, but to say it's exceptionally positive. And I continue to seek Matt out uh, in a way that it's not just a, as a sponsor, but somebody that uh, I think has done nothing but great things uh, for us professionally and has uh, done great things for me at two stops now. And Congruity HR is um, the best company that I could tell you to look for if you're in need of a PEO or something similar to that. So uh, whether it be payroll, HR, anything else, uh, either reach out to myself um, I will say that's a little bit more dangerous in today's world because I just don't have the opportunity to get back to people as much as I'd like to. Uh, but reach out to the Nolcast. We'll get you in touch with Matt Lewis and the team at Congruity and uh, very certain that you will have a similar experience uh, that I have had with him. Did uh, did you respond to the T-shirt email from him or do I need to? I, I can't see our responses from, from the forwarded account, so yeah, I probably our- need to. So I'll take a look at that. I have not. No. Okay. All right. I Matt, uh, we got you. I think this is kind of like a you take it, I got it, base hit, lose the ball game uh, type situation here. So uh, I look like Blake Bortles. Okay. Interesting. The people that I get the most often, who, who do I look like? Uh, Josh Allen, apparently, which I don't know. Uh, there's a hockey player that plays on Washington. Um. And then, I don't know, there's some actor, but he's only, only on Netflix stuff. And I, I, I don't think I'm anywhere in that ballpark. It must be the ring light. So, you know. It must be the ring light. Uh, um, yeah. So, uh, Blake Bortles. I actually have a Blake Bortles story I cannot tell right now. So there you go. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you after the, uh, after the show. It's something, something for later. Uh, so Bro, tight, tight ends. ends. There's a million of them. This, this segment is going to take forever. Uh, Jarrell Powers is, is one piece that you have a, a high degree of confidence is going to be on your roster going into 24. Uh, Douglas, at this point, you would expect him to be as well and, and really excited about what you saw out of some of the final games of the year from him. Uh, this is kind of a situation where I was talking uh, maybe 20 minutes ago about using 23 to get ready for 24, and uh, I certainly think Jaheim Bell uh, will have a nice year and go on and do his thing on Sundays, but it would be fascinating to see how ready you can get Morlock, what you uh, can kind of transition him into as he moves from shorter to Florida State, which is one of the more uh, significant changes of uh, college football landscape that I could imagine. Ton of numbers here uh, and and names that, uh, you know, will be selective in referencing just because, uh, you got a lot of you've done a lot at the tight end position to change that room, particularly with what you did in the portal here. Um, as far as high school targets, there's a Castile kid out of New Orleans that uh, I know they're looking at, and or I believe that they're looking at. Um, I don't know that you really have a whole lot of other options uh, on the on the radar. The kid so going far. to Georgia is like definitely the dude that I think everybody in the country wants. He's just yeah. He's shocked he's going to Georgia. Georgia Georgia might have a Heisman winner. (laughs) Shocked a high level tight end is going to Georgia out of high school. Uh, Crazy. Yeah. Um, So, like, we think the odds that Morlock and Bell are at least one of them is going to be on the roster for 24, right? I think the odds that you have two tight ends both forgo their final year of eligibility is low. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then you get you get Douglas, who I'm kind of excited about since he'll be a year four guy in 24. Like right, the odds you get Morlock Douglas, Bell Douglas, or Morlock Bell Douglas are are pretty high. I'd be shocked if, if the only guy you have coming back with experience is Douglas. Like you mentioned, getting the young guy's experience too in some of these games and be able to practice better, honestly, is, is going to be a key here. I, I leave that in like 
Do you anticipate FSU having to take a transfer tight end? Uh, I don't anticipate them having to. No. Now, maybe they, again, maybe they've put on a, a great show with Bell and sure. tight end is a, a piece of this offense that could get kind of featured in a manner that maybe other options don't think they could. But um, no, I, I would be. And look, crazy things can happen in the portal. You know, Douglas may get offered a, a significant deal from a Big Ten school or something like that. Um, you never know. Um, so it, it's hard to predict too far in the future. But I do um, – I, I will watch this position and am really quite curious as to what happens with Brian Courtney. I mean, that, that is a very high-ceiling kid. Um, maybe it's just – message board chatter uh or or so to say to think that maybe that kid moves to defense i don't know uh but that is a a prospect that i i don't think you just kind of cast aside uh if some of these other numbers start to uh consume his snaps i, I think you try to figure out what you can do with that and, and deploy him in a manner that you get uh, at least the opportunity of production really raw you knew that going in uh but i will be fascinated to see what happens with courtney yeah, for, I mean, really, really no doubt there. And I, I think, like, I mean, the odds that you get a transfer out of this room, too, I think is at least decent with, especially if if for some reason Bell comes back and you have Morlock, Bell, Douglas, Jackson West, Brian Courtney, Jarrell Powers all in the room. Like, I, I don't think you're going to run that back in totality. So I, I, I would – guess no no transfer tight end unless just this is one where like if it's a need i'm gonna be shocked if there's a really really special player like you said makes sense to, to take one um one to two i think from the high school ranks probably just one again if we're sticking with the theme of recruiting for upside but then again like tight end such a pro, like a projection position you you may need to throw two numbers at it understanding that most likely only one of the guys is actually going to hit at a high level and that's that's okay it's just kind of one of the things and the other guy will transfer out to the mac uh or to you know down to fcs or whatever um also is preston daniel going to be on scholarship if he's still around at 24 because that would be his redshirt senior year that that would typically be the time if he's not on one now that you would do it i would be very surprised by that Okay. Um, I, I, obviously, I, I don't know anything more than anybody else does, but just from a logistic standpoint, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to me uh, with numbers, unless he, uh, you know, starts consuming snaps in a manner that we're not otherwise projecting. So, yeah, that makes sense. And his snap count probably goes down, not up, given the, the guys you just brought in. Hard to see how <laughs> yeah. that would that would not transpire. Uh, the wide receiver position. Okay, Hakeem Williams, we talked about him. Beginning of the show, really excited. Um, Vandravius Jacobs is a kid that you just signed. Uh, Goldie Lawrence is another high school prospect. You have two wide receiver prospects committed. You have two wide receiver prospects committed because one Mr. Um, is it Tywoski Adam Abrams? How do I pronounce that exactly? Uh, Tawaski Abrams. Tawaski Abrams commits to you. Uh, interesting prospect there. Camden Fryer, the legacy uh, out of Lake City, Columbia, uh, is committed to you already as well. Be fascinated to see whether or not uh, you have the ability to hold on to those kids. But uh, this is a whole lot of names moving around, and this is an area where I think you continue to lean on the portal. All right, so let, let, let's watch some Tawaski Abrams here. Uh, this is a kid I'm fairly familiar with. He's from Dunbar. Obviously, I keep up with the Fort Myers area uh, quite a bit. You just saw we're, we're watching this huddle here. He is going to be in the slot, um, you know, 5'10 kid. The, the one thing I would say is he's exceptionally quick. I think he has good balance and body control. And watching him here, he turns the corner. So he's playing Vero there. I mean, Vero is not a like a super high level team. It's not like you're playing like, you know, 6A ball over in Miami. Th th this is in the Fort Myers area, which is going to be in Southwest Florida. But like a productive kid, I think he fights for the ball really well. The hands look good. I think he, he competes for the ball well. The quickness, the change of direction, I like a lot. Uh, I, I think he actually is pretty fast. Now, I will note he has some track times. There's a 10-6 something, but I looked it up on one of those track websites that we have access to. 
and that was 0.3 wind aided. So that tells me that's more like a 10 9 in the 100, which is not bad for a guy at the end of his sophomore year, to, to be clear. Like, I, I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm just saying I don't want the chat to think we have a guy that's running like a non wind aided 10 6 in May of 2022, right? Because then, like, at that point, what, what are you going for the Olympics? But by, by, by the time you're you know, like he's not Marvin Bracey, Kermit Whitfield level fast. He is a dude that makes a, a whole lot of plays. Um, and I think somebody that, you know, you're, you're going to need somebody to do a lot of your stop start stuff, catch some screens, play in space, a guy you could probably throw in back to a little bit and motion him out. Uh, and and I think probably a good take. I, I do want to see what he runs. He, he did run at the state meet and uh, I, I found his time from the state meet. He ran, uh, where's he at here? He ran 10.89, uh, and that was with a, a 0.9 uh, wind aid. So that's fairly consistent. Now, that was good for 13th place in uh, the boys' 3A uh, also in May. Um, look, I think this guy is relatively fast. I don't know exactly how fast he is on like the mile-an-hour thing. I'll, I hope he'll go to either like Orlando ESPN camp or the Miami Under Armour or one of those. And I'm sure I'll get to see him a number of times this year as well on the seven on circuit. I, I think it's probably a pretty good take. He rates in the national top 300 right now. Uh, overall, we'll see where, where he shakes out. But um, it's a player they like early. They identified if he continues to progress, I think he stays in the class. Yep. Right. And that's all you can say about most of these kids right now. Camden Fryer is a dude who, I think we'll stay in the class for sure. He has a lot of juice to his game and also competes for the ball. Like they definitely have guys who make plays on the ball right now. So uh, if you're talking about the uh, kind of pattern, that's that a serious jets right there, by the way, on the one that I don't know if you just saw that one. That was yeah. like, he's, if you're on YouTube, he's, he's going, going like he's got this guy is fast. Yeah. Watch. Whoop. Yep. Uh, a whole, yeah. whole lot of angles being melted. Um, mm -hmm. So, Deuce Span to me is the guy to watch next year in twenty three to get an idea as to how big of a piece he is in twenty four for you. Does does Deuce turn into this flyer that you took? That oh my gosh, this guy's you know has continued to blossom and is all the ready all of a sudden to be like the physical prospect that the coaches at Illinois knew that he was and and everything else associated with with Span and his potential. Um, like you said, in theory, Wilson could be with you in 24. I don't think there's a snowball chance of hell in that personally. Uh, and then, so Malik McLean transferred out. You got a little bit of clarity there, but then you've still got, you know, Williamson, um, uh, Kentron, uh, Douglas, uh, whatever Keem Williams is looking like at this point. Um, yep. Yeah, this is where, um, this is where 23 will give you a pretty good idea as to what 24 might look like as some of these prospects emerge and what the, um, you know, what the kids out of the Wilsons and the Pittmans of the world uh, show you and, and how they can kind of use 23 to establish themselves as, as uh, major pieces for 24. I, I think that makes sense. Like, I think you take a, like one transfer receiver, unless like, two of the juniors you just named mentioned step up right I, I because wilson we assume is gone to the nfl if you get two of span williamson kentron and jakai to like really really step up and then one of the freshmen either keem dre or or, or goldie uh then i don't think you necessarily have to take one but Unless that happens, I think you may need to be in the market for like a true number one for that 2024 team. Unless Keem is really ready to come out and dominate, like like he's clearly the guy with that ability. Or or maybe Darian Williamson, who has flashed at times when he stayed healthy. Bless you. Look at that, man. We we God, we were just podcasting like extraordinarily well. Muting just to be clear, before we sneeze. Uh, okay, good. I I, I wanted to ask. You saw that, not heard that. Right? I saw that, not heard that. Okay, yeah. Good. Yeah, it, for, right. for those of us who are listening to our morning on the podcast, Agro <laughs> hit, hit the mute button right before he sneezed. Beautiful. Um, now, high school wise, this is interesting because they are taking players at a at a rate 
that makes me think that they are going to try to take like maybe four out of the high school ranks, which would surprise me a little bit considering the fact they just took three. But like if you're taking Tawaski now and you've already taken Camden, I think you need to get like two top top 100 level receivers out of the high school ranks this year to follow up what you did with Keem. You know, two guys that have like elite upside and and you need to get a size guys too, for sure. Uh, like like you, you need to get a true X out there. Um, so maybe they go four out of high school here. I, I don't know. I'd be surprised. Like right now I've got them at one quarterback, two running backs, probably one to two tight ends. So that's four to five, three to four, uh, you know, receivers. So like, I mean, that's like, I think you're like eight before you, on the offensive recruiting side before you can get to the offensive line. Yeah. Um, Got some great names uh, at the wide receiver position in the high school ranks. I think you'll continue There's to a see, and uh, Florida oh. State won't be short on options. I will say, um, if you guys live in South Florida, Jeremiah Smith is somebody like I would I'd pay to go watch. Like he is probably the closest thing I've seen to Julio Jones since Julio Jones. So what what he did to. Uh, Shoot the, the 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 corner who's committed to Clemson out 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 of, out of the uh, Tampa area. He destroyed him, mm-hmm. like literally. They were not throwing the ball to Jeremiah Smith because they were kind of spreading it around. And I was like, I'm trying to shoot a video of Jeremiah Smith, and I was like, Can we throw the ball to Jeremiah Smith? And then it was four plays in a row, and he just uh, they just embarrassed him. Huh. I mean, it was it was non com like the kid the kid going to Clemson is a good corner, like legitimately a top. 200 level player who is a really good track guy too and not competitive Mm -hmm. when when they're like hey we're gonna start going to this kid it was just yeah um so he's committed to ohio state right now if uh if for some reason that changes that is an all hands on deck situation (laughs) fantastic absolutely hopefully uh... did uh crystal ball trader to miami uh, Jojo Trader, his, his teammate at Chaminade. Obviously, Steve Wolfong is like the literal godfather of recruiting and generally knows what's up. Yeah. I will say, like, that's going to depend on how Miami's offense looks this fall. There's a lot of Miami connections there. You're probably not getting Trader if your offense looks that damn bad again. Mm-hmm. I would think. We'll, uh, we'll see. We'll thank our friends at um, Madison Social Township and the fantastic Charlie Park, a wonderful place for us, a spot that I always uh, make it a habit of going by. Charlie Park is Tallahassee's best rooftop bar. Matt Thompson has been uh, part of the Nolcast since the Nolcast was created and played a large role in the Nolcast ever being created. So uh, big thanks to our longtime friends there. Again, whether it be Madison Social Township uh, or the cool rooftop bar over there at Cascades Park, uh, so many great options. And and thank Matt and his team for the support that they give uh, to the Nolcast. So yes, do sir. we want to uh, – I think we should probably shelve the offensive lineman and bring that back for a future show just based off where we are time-wise. Um, I think we, we might be able to do it like – I think we can do it quick. Let's do it. Let's All do right. it. So, Emmanuel Roddick, and I'm pretty sure Bless Harris do not have another year. Bless Harris, maybe because of, of the the getting hurt last year, maybe has it an additional year. But I thought those guys are probably done. Almost certainly Emmanuel, even if he comes back this year, if they get the waiver. And then mm-hmm. Roddick, I, I, I can't make the Roddick thing work. Herring, Scott, Washington, Marie Smith, Byers, and Keandre Jones, I'm almost certain can play another year after this one. If they want to, if they like right. buyers, maybe going pro, I don't know. Then you get Schrader and Estes just kind of getting moving day for those guys. Not necessarily like need to start this year, but need to show some real improvement. If you want to, you know, get on the field and then you get all, you get all the, uh, the redshirt freshmen, the freshman Armella, you know, Jalen early Quayshon Sapp, Dr. Richardson, Ken, Ken I Charlton, Lucas Simmons, and Chris Andre Otto. Uh, Got a couple targets. I don't even really like want to start on the board. Let's save some time on that because these kids are going to emerge. I will say I'm not super impressed with the O-line class in the state of Florida this year. Mm-hmm. So that may be the one spot you have to leave the state to go get some dudes in. Heard similar. 
a couple um, times now from people. Yeah, like it's just not it's not great so far. They, they offered a kid here, like literally right by my house. Uh, you know, Vito. We'll see. Like, I don't know if he's a no doubt FSU level kid. We'll we'll see. Um, I think you need to probably take three from the high school ranks. I'm not conv- like this might be a spot, man. You don't need to go portal. Like they at this point, you have so many bodies. You have 18 bodies in there right now. You could return 15 bodies. Like, do you think they go portal here again? I think they might only because they. Th- this may be your singular biggest competitive advantage in the portal uh, out there. So uh, as far as the coach you have and the ability to grab levels of prospects that you weren't able to get from the high school level with the exception of really Armella um, so far. So it wouldn't shock me, uh, but I, I agree. If you got a whole lot of time here for the board to develop and for kind of some of this to make more sense. Um, but I could see Florida State continuing to grab one or two out of the portal for as, as long as they have as many kids that are interested in playing with the coach that they have. Especially, I guess, if uh, if Byers and Scott both go pro, then you, in theory you could lose both starting tackles if Byers ends up playing tackle, right? Mm-hmm. So like that that could be an opening. But I think you really want to get a multi year guy if if you hit portal. Like I don't know if you go portal hunting for just for. Like like one one senior. Oh, the Fangs Up podcast. Nice. Our, appreciate our, get those likes up. Our fam cousin checking in. Appreciate it, my man. Uh, yes, great sir. to hear from you. So, um, um yeah, I feel man. Good well, about where they are line wise. I think I feel very good. Feel very good. good. They've yeah. got they have changed the numbers there, and uh, will be fascinating to see. But I I think that's a group that going to continue to uh, to trend in the right direction and. Um. Uh, yeah, man, you just got to kind of got to comment by the tail or whatever, so to say, when with with the uh, position coach that you have there, uh, you've got a guy that's got an ability to to connect with kids at a at a unique unique level, and um, mm, not a moment too soon <laughs> for Florida State to to stumble into a an offensive line coach that has the ability to change the room in the manner that he has. So that's, that's so, fantastic to watch. To recap this, one quarterback, I think you need to take two backs, probably one to two tight ends, three to four receivers, and probably need to take three linemen, not four, high school-wise. That's like 11. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, if you're not able to get really high level guys, maybe you maybe you cut that down to like ten or nine and and, and go portal just for for depth purposes, so you're not having these depth only guys take up four years on your roster. Uh, but I mean, that's uh, that's got the makings of, of a pretty nice high school class, man. And they certainly have a lot more juice on the trail this year than they did last year. So we're going to find out. I think we're going to find out more about just how good some of these defensive guys are at recruiting. Because offensively, mm-hmm. I got a pretty good feel that this is a relatively good offensive recruiting staff especially Atkins who is you know like like a cheat code so you know cool man uh yeah an hour and 12 flu game for you yeah it's all right <laughs> <laughs> it was well earned had a had one of the more uh fun evenings and dinners that I've had in quite a while last night so Nice man. Paying for it with a little bit of a head cold this morning or this uh this evening. This morning it's nine fifty five at night. But uh <laughs> yeah. It's been a been a fun couple of months. Absolutely. Yes, sir. All right, dude. I uh, will see you uh see you Monday. All right, brother. Thoroughly enjoyed it and very much look forward to the schedule show that we have uh, lined up on Monday. So all right. Appreciate it, guys. Thumbs up in the chat. See y'all soon.